ಸಾಗ್ರಜಾತ ಸಹ ಗಣ ರಘುನಾಥೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವಧೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದ ಸಹ ಗಣ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀಷಾಧೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣ ಸಿಂಧು ದೀನಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಾಂಗಿ ರಾಧೆ ವೃಂದೇಶ್ವರಿ ವಿಷಭಾನುಷು ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಪಂಚಕಲ್ಪತರೋ ವ್ಯಶ್ಚ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧೋ ವ್ಯಹೇವಿತೇಭ್ಯೋ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧ್ಯಾಸಾಧ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಟು ಆರ್ ಗೀತಾ ಕ್ಲಾಸಸ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆನ್ chapter 3 of the bhagavad gita which is entitled as karma yoga and the last time we had just begun the chapter 3 of the bhagavad gita and uh, we began to discuss the first uh, topic of chapter 3 which is tyaga or renunciation which is the first nine verses of this chapter so um let me just quickly recollecting what we discussed last time um so this chapter begins with the question of arjun rather a confusion that arjun is trying to clarify and uh, he is trying to ask krishna which part do you recommend do you recommend the part of knowledge buddhi which is um technically the part of renunciation of yaga or do you remember the part of karma or action which is technically the part of uh, work so according to arjun tyaga or another uh, the idea of renunciation uh, um, and the idea of um, acquiring knowledge simply means that you give up your responsibilities go to the forest and keep reading that's what arjun's typical idea of uh, tyaga is uh, and that's what arjun feels krishna is trying to recommend him when he uses the word buddhi yoga several times in the second chapter so arjun is clarifying what do you expect of me so um, last time we saw arjun's questions and this time we will go a little deeper to stand what exactly krishna is trying to answer uh, to arjun and uh, what is krishna's recommendation actually in this context so that is what we will be discussing last time we began with, uh, a little bit of uh, krishna's uh, thought process but now we'll go deeper into the process and understand this concept nicely so the verses 1 to 9 of this third chapter are very revealing in the sense that they show the uh, incredible qualities of a man living in this world and not of a celibate or a brahmachari not of someone who is living in the state of sanyas ashram who has given up all connections of this world but it is about someone who is part of his world and trying to serve so chapter 3 technically is a story of all of us who are a part of this audience and it comes as a ray of hope for most of us because um many people have this misunderstanding that spirituality is possible for sanyasis who are living in the forest for uh, people who are um not having any worldly responsibilities for people who are not um uh, you know in the sense the regular uh, type of people 
So uh, a lot of people feel that unless and until you are a renunciant, unless and until you are a sadhu or a monk staying in a monastery, someone who is disconnected from life, disconnected from all responsibilities, only then you can progress in spiritual life. So chapter three is almost like a breather. It's like a sigh of relief for all those people who think spirituality is not meant for them. So let us try to understand what Krishna is trying to tell us uh, in this chapter and uh, you know, how Krishna is trying to help Arjun understand the concept of uh, Kyaga. Perfection does not come by working or renouncing. Perfection comes by doing whatever we do in the spirit of devotion. Uh, renouncements can be proud of renouncing. You know, um, I mean, it is very much possible someone might uh, completely renounce the world, but he might be so proud of the fact that I have renounced everything. And that's not exactly spiritual perfection, right? There was a, a, a Brahmana who was uh, sleeping uh, and uh, near the bank of a river. And uh, it was becoming time for his Sandhya Vandana. So usually uh, Brahmanas do, uh, you know, uh, Gayatri three times a day, three sun uh, uh, peaks, basically. So it was time for his uh, noon uh, Gayatri, but he was sleeping. And someone woke him up saying that, hey, it's time for your Gayatri. Please do your Gayatri. This guy got up quickly, washed himself and sat and did his Gayatri perfectly on time. And then he sought out this person who actually helped him wake up and, you know, on time. So he didn't miss his Gayatri. He said, I have been doing perfect Gayatri all my life. And if you had not woken me, I would have missed today. I'm so grateful to you that you helped me. Please tell me who are you. And this person who woke him up said, I'm Kali personified. Kali personified means this Kali Yuga, this age personified, woke him up. And then Brahmana was shocked. He said, what? Uh, when did Kali Yuga change its stance? How come Kali Yuga is waking up somebody to do Gayatri on time? Has Kali Yuga changed into Satya Yuga? This Kali, Kali Purush, you know, the personified person of Kali, he said, no, I purposely woke you. So, and then he explained, he said, by, if you had not woken up, you would have been so miserable and so sad. And in that sadness, you would have become humble, thinking that, you know, you're useless and not so good and all. But, by doing Gayatri perfectly on time, you have become so proud that I never ever miss it. That is worse than missing it, he said. A lot of times, we don't understand how actually pride is worse than renunciation itself. So somebody might be very renounced externally, but might be proud of the fact that he's renounced. Um, and this, on the other hand, work, someone who is working, who is householder, who has a family, that person might be proud of owning so much of, of the bank balance, of their, of their abilities, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Everyone is proud of something or the other, isn't it? Uh, it's not exact, you can't exactly say this is better or that is better. There were three boys who were uh, discussing about their fathers. And uh, each of them trying to uh, surpass the other. So one boy said, my uh, father is a, um, he's so fast. He's so fast that he shoots an arrow. He's an archer. But <clears throat> when he shoots the arrow, before the arrow reaches the mark, my father reaches the mark. The other two boys were amazed. Wow, what a fast father. The second fellow said, my father, he, he shoots with gun. Before the bullet reaches the target, my father reaches the target. The third fellow was, he didn't want to you know, let go. He said, uh, 
my father is a government servant office gets over at 5 o'clock he, he reaches home at 3 o'clock and the idea of competition trying to prove i'm better than somebody else <laughs> it doesn't leave you anywhere isn't it whichever field you are in and whichever space you are in so here um for a lot of people who are thinking that renunciation is is better than uh, working or somebody who is thinking that work is better than renunciation both have their own problems own set of issues and own set of good in them so it's not about this or that the idea is we need to attain perfection in whatever state we are by doing everything in the spirit of devotion and that spirit of devotion is what makes everything beautiful and everything perfect so um krishna he speaks a very beautiful verse uh in the third chapter the fourth verse of the third chapter कृष्ण से न कर्मणाम अनारंभ नैस्कर्म्यं पुरुषोस्ते न च सन्यास्य एव सिद्धिं समाधि गच्छति हि सेइंग नॉट बाय मियरली अब्स्टेनिंग फ्रॉम वर्क कैन वन अचीव फ्रीडम फ्रॉम रिएक्शन नॉर बाय रिनंसिएशन अलोन कैन वन अटेन परफेक्शन now these sentences that krishna speaks are sometimes sometimes such a gooly you know if you don't have someone who can explain what this means to you you don't understand anything from it just read the sentence and you know, let's see how complicated this is you know not by merely abstaining from work can one achieve freedom from reaction nor by renunciation alone can one attain perfection what does it really mean let's discuss krishna is telling arjun by taking sanyas no one becomes perfect and by renounce renunci- by renunciation one may get siddhis so now this verse is not against taking sanyas nor does it advocate that you know uh you live a life of marriage and have children nor does it encourage not working either so this this verse is a very neutral verse and it's an amazingly balanced verse that krishna is speaking because krishna is going very much deep into the concept of what really spirituality is after all there are many people who think that um you know unusual idea of renunciation is wrong like one of two of our devotees were traveling in a taxi and one taxi wala is giving advice to them is telling them that uh, you all both are living off other people isn't it imagine he's asking them this question you all are living off other people isn't it? he said i don't do like that i work hard i work hard from 5 am to 9 pm and i earn all my own money and what are you all doing you are living off other people's money you are not working at all you just enjoying your life and other people are paying for your food and uh, expenses and all that so he said you should be like me he is telling them yeah. he doesn't understand what kind of responsibilities and pressures somebody in the renounced order of life has to undergo how much stress is there in hearing other people's problems all day long you sit and hear other people's problems you will understand for how much effort that is you know um, on one level it might seem that you know it's a easy life on one level it might seem that you know, uh, the person is not earning anything not working and all but uh, on the other level it's not about running away from responsibilities it's a different type of responsibility just like you need police people because you see the policeman you understand this police fellow is there to help me you feel you know of course nowadays you can't say that exactly but at least uh, technically the police uniform is supposed to give you that confidence basically yeah so similarly the renounced order of life it is supposed to give you confidence that somebody is there to help me when i am going through difficulties in my life so uh, renunciation should never be an escapism from responsibilities 
uh, but it should rather be uh, in the mood of serving human society uh, and uh, in a way that is beneficial, in a way that is uh, good. So uh, Krishna is saying, Nacha Sanyasya Evam Siddhim Samadhi Vajjati. That means by just quitting things, you will not get Siddhis. You will not be able to perfect. Just by thinking that I'm going to give up, it doesn't mean that you're going to get perfect. So uh, perfection uh, comes when you understand the mood with which sannyas is taking. So there are three types of sannyas or renunciation. Please hear this carefully. There are three types of renunciation. The first type of renunciation is actually taking sannyas, where one renounces one's family, home, money, everything, and takes on the renounced order of life. This is the last stage of Varnashram. When one has perfected all other stages of life, takes sannyas and perfects his life. Now, not everyone is ready for this type of sannyas. So if you are not ready for this type of sannyas, there's a second type of sannyas that can be followed. And this is very interesting. The second type of sannyas is where you work hard now. Work so hard, serve Krishna now uh, in such a way that at some point in your life, you can quit work. There are a lot of people who try this. That means they work hard until they are 50 years of age, 50, 55. Work hard, save enough, you know, uh, take enough responsibilities. And exactly at 55, 60, whatever that age is, they retire. Completely renounce their work, basically. And then they, they still remain in the family, but they serve the mission of Srila Prabhupada. They serve the mission uh, uh, by, you know, uh, doing selfless service. So there are many grahasthas who are still grahasthas, but they are sannyasis. They are great sannyasis because they are not after money. They, are, they have quit their jobs because they have earned enough to maintain their families. And now they are full-time engaged in serving Krishna. This is the second type of sannyas. The third type of sannyas is where you stay in your family, continue to work, earn, but give up the mentality that this is mine. Instead, use everything you have in the service of Krishna till the last breath of your life. This is also sannyas. Sannyas doesn't necessarily mean giving up things. Sannyas also means giving up the thought that this is mine. When you say, I give up the thought that this house belongs to me, this bank balance belongs to me, this family belongs to me. That actually is sannyas in the mind on a, on a mental level, basically. When you understand that everything belongs to Krishna, I am only a caretaker. I am only just doing a little bit of my responsibility. That's sannyas. It's not just about saying I'll do it, but actually doing it, basically. So these three are the levels of renunciation. While not everyone may be ready for the first level of renunciation, everyone can do the second and the third level of renunciation. It's about the consciousness. And that is what Krishna consciousness is all about. So um, now Gita is not trying to give up, not recommending us to give up this and give up that. Gita is not telling us only the first level of sannyas is sannyas. Gita is talking about three levels of sannyas. And therefore, Krishna is telling Arjun, don't prematurely give up anything. He is telling Arjun, don't prematurely give up anything out of frustration, of desire for fame, or you know, some kind of escapism. But do it in the right, with the right understanding. The next words Krishna speaks about is very interesting again. He says, Nahi kaschit shanamapi jatu tistati atarmakrit. Karyate ki avasya karma, sarva pradati jayadhani. Says, everyone is forced to act helplessly according to the qualities he has acquired for the modes of material nature. Therefore, no one can refrain from doing anything for even a moment. This word, nahi kaschit shanamapi, is a very beautiful word. Jatva tistati akarmakrit. 
He's saying none of us can be inactive for even a moment. How can you just go and sit and meditate, do nothing? Impossible. When you sit to meditate and you think that I'm going to do nothing, the mind is so wildly active. The mind is going all over the world. And we say that we are inactive. Impossible. The soul is very active. And because the soul is very active, it needs activity. One cannot just renounce prematurely uh, because one is active. The body is active because the soul is active. Everywhere you can see activity going on. Even when you sit, there is activity going on on a mental level. And therefore, somebody may not be physically doing anything, but mentally may be doing, may be doing a lot. Why, you know, I'm sure for all those of you who are chanting the holy names, Hare Krishna, you will experience this. You seem to be sitting and chanting in one place, but your mind is running at such a speed. So it, it is doing so many things. Therefore, Krishna is telling Arjuna, you cannot renounce immaturely. This is very important. He says, he, or he gives Arjun three options. He's telling Arjun, you do one of these three. Either you act in the mode of, according to the three modes of material nature. Sarva prakriti jaya bhumi. Under the modes of goodness, passion, ignorance. The mode of goodness makes you act honestly, truthfully, do your work nicely. Mode of passion will make you act just do it by hook or crook. And the mode of ignorance will make you act by drinking liquor, then sleep, then drink again, then sleep. It will make you act in some way or the other. The three modes are making you act in some way. The second way in which you can act is an act to serve Krishna. So thus, uh, Arjun can be acting upon the three modes of material nature or act by serving Krishna. And uh, when, you, when, you, when you do some action in the service of Krishna, it is actually a very high level of action. Only a very advanced person can remain without any activity. Prabhupada spoke about four types of people. One is a lazy fool. Foolish, but very lazy. I don't know how many of you have come across lazy fools in your life. Lazy fools are so lazy and they are so foolish that uh, they are too lazy to even do anything. The second type of person Robert talks about is an active fool. Active fools are very dangerous. You know, uh, I'm sure you've seen monkeys around, right? Very active, but very foolish also. Very dangerous guys. So there are some human beings who are active fools. The third category of people are active intelligent. They're active, but they're very intelligent. Fourth category of people are lazy intelligent. Lazy intelligent, so Prabhupada said, only advanced people can be lazy intelligent. Whereas all other people should be active intelligent. And, and you know, there's a very beautiful example of what it means to be advanced, uh, uh, sorry, what it means to be lazy intelligent. There was once a Brahman sitting on the banks of a river, sitting on the bank of the Godavari River, and he was meditating. In his meditation, he was preparing kheer for Radha Krishna. I don't know how many of you all have ever tried preparing kheer in your mind. <laughs> you can try this after hearing this story. Yeah. So this uh, Brahman, he was sitting on the banks of the Godavari River, and in his mind preparing kheer for Radha Krishna. And he was very meticulous in his Preparation, you know, he started right from the point of going and buying ingredients. Mentally, he's going to the market, you know, uh, buying uh, rice and buying milk and buying uh, kesar and buying uh, sugar and bringing it all back. And then uh, mentally, he's boiling the milk, he's uh, putting the rice, uh, washed rice into the milk, he's putting the right proportion of sugar into the milk. He's stirring it and stirring it and stirring it and stirring it. Or you want to make good kheer, you have to at least stir it for half an hour to 45 minutes. And, uh, and this man, he's doing all that mentally, completely. 
and then after the key was completely ready uh, he wanted to offer it to radha krishna and he kept it for cooling down for some time and uh, you know he waited for a certain amount of time thinking that the key is cool and he wanted to check if the key is the right temperature for me to offer it to radha krishna and to check the temperature he just put one finger inside the key and the moment he put that finger he was opening his mind and he's he's imagining it the moment he put that finger into the key it was burning hot and suddenly his meditation broke and he came out of the meditation and lo and behold he saw his finger was burnt in real he was doing this whole key in imagination but his finger got burnt in real isn't this an amazing story when you see an advanced person meditating his activity is going on in another plane he is not inactive you see somebody sitting over there and closing his eyes and meditating don't think he is inactive he is very active but on another plane basically because he is serving on a spiritual level basically. there was another uh, exalted person named raghunath das goswami who was one of the six goswamis of uh, vrindavan so raghunath das goswami he in his dream in his vision in his dream he had a dream that uh, shrimati radharani gave him a lot of kheer and in real he got a stomach upset and the most amazing thing so everybody in vrindavan were amazed when they saw raghunath das goswami having a stomach upset you know why because raghunath das goswami the only thing he ate is in his palms he would uh, drink daily two drops of buttermilk in his palm that was his diet all days diet imagine two drops of buttermilk is his entire days diet and a person who is only drinking two drops of buttermilk how can he get diarrhea how can he get the stomach upset is it even logically possible but it happened so everybody in vrindavan are amazed that here he is getting a vision that radha rani is giving him here and in real his stomach is getting upset now obviously we are very very far away from this level of uh, of uh, activity this is this is what robot talks it as lazy intelligence and extraordinarily crazy but actually on an inner level there is a mother dimension of activity going on so uh, so krishna is trying to tell arjun that don't ever think that you can be inactive impossible the nature of the atma is to always be active but we need to learn to do that kind of activity that is in consciousness of krishna so then krishna uses a very interesting words in the gita this is the uh, third chapter uh, third chapter sixth verse he says karmendriyani samyamya ye aste manasa smaram इंद्रियार्थम विमूढ आत्मा मिथ्याचार स उच्यते इ सेस वन हु रिस्ट्रेन्स द सेंसेस ऑफ एक्शन बट हुज माइंड डवेल्स ऑन सेंस ऑब्जेक्ट्स सर्टेनली डिल्यूट्स हिमसेल्फ इन इज कॉल्ड अ प्रिटेंडर और अ मिथ्याचार सो दैट मींस एक्सटर्नली ही मे बी इन अ रिनाउंस्ड ऑर्डर ऑफ लाइफ बट इंटरनली ही इज थिंकिंग ऑफ सेंस ऑब्जेक्ट्स so like for example uh, you know his holiness dadanath swami maharaj um, in his book the journey home he speaks about a uh, about a story experience of his when he was in nepal uh, he visited a place known as janakpur janakpur is mithila is a uh, a place uh, in nepal which where mother sita was born so um, when uh, uh, when this when dadanath maharaj was in janakpur he uh, met a sadhu who was uh, you know blessing a lot of people and all that and they are no one knew english they were simple people who were uh, you know uh, coming to meet the sadhu so then radhanath swami happened to come there uh, radhanath swami was an american uh, his name was richard before and uh, you know 19 20 year old boy he went to meet the sadhu in uh, in, in nepal to ask for blessings 
And the Sadhu asked Radhanath Maharaj, you know, at that time he was in Richard, he asked him, where are you from? Which place are you from? And Maharaj said, I'm from America. The Sadhu said, you are from America and you have given up America. Richard said, yes, I've given up because I've come to search for God. You know, I've come to the land of India, search for God. And, uh, and the Sadhu was amazed. He said, what God are you talking about? There is no God. There is, he said, you're a fool to come, leave America and come here in search of God. He said, go back to America and enjoy your life. There is no God at all. And this sadhu, he was wearing, you know, the uh, renounced uh, uh, attire because he was thinking that is a medium of earning money. Giving blessings, we call Ashurvat Babas. Give blessings, and people give some donation. And that's how you make a living, basically. So, um, this man was very upset with Maharaj. That how did you give up America? Everybody wants to go to America. How did you give up America? I was like, literally shocked and bewildered, thinking that somebody has actually given up the opulence of America to come and live a life of a renunciant, basically. So, Prabhupada explains how this idea of Vityachar is a very powerful idea and uh, it's about alignment on an inner and outer level basically. So if one practices meditation or Krishna consciousness, the result should be very clear. And Prabhupada gives a very amazing uh, definition of what is the result of someone who is practicing spiritual life nicely. And this is a verse from the Shivan Bhagavatam, a very beautiful verse that talks about the Result of anyone practicing spiritual life nicely. So this verse says, Bhakti Pareshan Bhava Viraktir Anyatra Trika Eka Kala uh, Prapdimana Syatha Shankara. So this verse says, and then finally it says, Pushti Pushti Shuddha Apayo uh, Anugasam. So Prabhupada says, when you eat food, three things happen. Anytime you eat food, these are three things that will always happen, right? Next time or after the class, if you're going to eat dinner, you'll observe this. First, tushti should happen when you eat food. Tushti means satisfaction. Immediately after eating food, feel satisfied. Wow, so nice to eat food. The second thing that happens when you eat food is pushti. Pushti means nourishment. You should feel strong. You should feel nourished. You should feel good after eating food. And the third, so that means the body gets energized, body gets nourished. The third thing is Shuddha Apayo Anugasa, which means on eating every bite of food, the hunger should be mitigated. Every morsel of food you eat, you should start feeling less hungry, less hungry, less hungry. And then the hunger is completely satisfied. Anything you do, you should, there should be a result coming out of it, isn't it? You work means some profit, some money should come. To study means you should clear some exam, basically. Similarly, when you're chanting, when you're practicing spiritual life, what is the result? What should happen as a result of chanting, as a result of practicing spiritual life? Three things should happen. First is uh, virakti. This is the first thing that happens when you practice spiritual. Virakti means there should be a natural detest of material things. That means we use them, but we don't become obsessed with them. So as you practice spiritual life nicely, as you chant nicely, you will live in material things, but you will not be affected by it overly. That means you will have money, but you will not be obsessed with money. You will have resources. You will have good comforts. But you will not be obsessed with it. So that means we don't make them our shelter. We use them. But we don't take shelter of them, basically. Detachment is the first sign of someone who is making progress spiritually. We develop a natural test for material things. Second is 
Parishanu Bhava. Uh, Isha means Krishna. Isha is God. Uh, Parishanu Bhava, which means Anubhava. The word Anubhava means Anubhava, right? Experience. The second thing that should happen when you practice spiritual life nicely, when you chant nicely is you should experience Krishna in your life. Now, what is that experience of Krishna? What do you mean by you will experience Krishna in your life? Um, I mean, does it mean that Krishna will come and give you milk? It doesn't mean that Krishna will come and uh, you know, uh, help you when, when you are uh, about to be to the maximum accident. It's not, a, it's not like that. Krishna, experiencing Krishna essentially means that in every situation of your life, you should be able to see the hand of Krishna in it. That is the meaning of the word experiencing Krishna in your life. Uh, I'll give you a very simple example of my own life. And, uh, you know, one time when I had a very powerful experience on a personal uh, level. Uh, when I began writing uh, the Ramayana series, for all those of you who know, I've been uh, writing a series of books on the Ramayana where I, I wrote the entire Ramayana in six volumes, basically. And uh, when I began writing, this is the first book I ever wrote in my life. And I had no idea what I was doing. And, uh, you know, in, in many years back, 10 years back almost, I was, I was slow. The first author in the entire ISKCON world get published with a very uh, high profile publishing house. And uh, I was staying in a temple and I was writing books on Ramayana and I was publishing outside. So I was very confused. I was very young at that point. I was like, what do you want or something? And I was very confused whether I'm doing the right thing or not. I, I, I didn't know whether I should be doing something like this or uh, is it right or is it wrong? Is it something that Krishna will be happy with? So I was very confused in my own world. You know? And in this confusion, somehow, you know, many months, this confusion lasted. And uh, I was traveling. And I happened to go to Mauritius at that point so for delivering some lectures. And the moment I say go on Mauritius, people start looking at me with a lot of suspicion. You know, that what am I going to these places for? So I have to give a clarification, like I go to give lectures and all that. <laughs> so anyway, so the point is that uh, when I was, when I went there, uh, I was, I was invited to give a lecture in one particular temple. And it was a very spontaneous invitation. I mean, this is not something that was prepared months in advance and all that. Just very spontaneously, they asked me, can you give a Bhagavatam class in the temple? I said, fine. Uh, and I walked in the temple uh, and they gave me the book, the Bhagavatam book that time to speak. And this was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was the third canto from the Bhagavatam. And I didn't know the verse. I didn't know which verse it was. I didn't know uh, which text I'm supposed to give, uh, give a lecture in. They just put me on the platform there and said, speak. And they gave me the book in my hand. Now speak on this verse. And I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what verse to expect, right? So I just opened the book and I read the verse. And when I read the translation of that verse, I was stunned. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. I was like shell shocked. Just to give you some background, Bhagavatam has 18,000 verses. 18,000 verses, okay? And out of the 18,000 verses, I could have been given any verse, correct? Potentially, 80, uh, what is the probability of me getting one particular verse out of the 18,000 verses? Not, there is no chance only of uh, any, any such uh, perfect combination happening, right? And nobody had any idea what thoughts were going on in my mind. And that particular day, as I opened this verse, in the third canto of Shiva Bhagavatam, in fact, in the entire 18,000 verses of Bhagavatam, there is only one section, the ninth canto of Bhagavatam, where there is a description of Ramayana. Now, Shukra Goswami is talking uh, Ramayana to Pariksha Maharaj. That is ninth canto. This is the third canto. In the third canto of Bhagavatam, there, is only, there are only two verses which talk about Ramayana. Only two verses. So now, the possibility of these two verses coming to me is next to impossible. But that day, 
these two verses only are going to be to speak to me. Of all the verses of Shivam Bhagavatam, I only got these two verses to speak from. And when I read those two verses, I was, I literally had tears in my eyes. Because I felt this is Krishna. I felt I am experiencing Krishna's answer to my doubts. It's a very simple thing. But in that one simple experience, I actually experienced Krishna. This is what, you know, this idea of Parishan Bhava means. You will not experience Krishna in big things in life. But you will surely experience Krishna in small things in life. And that's good enough. Each one of us, as we continue practicing spiritual life seriously and sincerely, you will go through experiences of Parishan and Bhava. You will go through experiences where you actually see Krishna reciprocating with you in your life. That is a proof that you're progressing in your spiritual journey. So the first is, the first uh, proof that you're progressing in your spiritual journey is Virakti, which means to experience detachment from mundane material things. Um, it's not that you don't have them, it's just that you don't feel attached to them. And the second thing is Parishana Bhava. That means you actually experience Krishna in small things in your life. And the third thing is Bhakti. Then comes the feeling that I love Krishna. Then comes the feeling Tremendous dedication, connection, relationship with Krishna. And you know, you start feeling having this strong uh, desire to want to connect with Krishna, want to see Krishna, want to reciprocate with Krishna, and want to reach Krishna. George Harrison, I don't know how many of y'all know of George Harrison from the Beatles. If you hear his songs of uh, his uh, feelings of connection with Krishna. There's a particular song that I highly recommend you all to hear called the My, My Sweet Lord. George Harrison, My Sweet Lord. Please YouTube it. You know, please search it. Google. You must hear it. Amazing. This guy he is not at all anywhere connected to the Vedic culture. European youngster. But he came across Srila Prabhupada, got in touch with Prabhupada, started chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. George Harrison, by the way, was chanting 16 rounds of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra most of his life. The last day when he was dying, he died after chanting 16 rounds of Hare Krishna Mahamantra. You can imagine what a... I mean, Prabhupada impacted him powerfully. And if you hear my sweet Lord, you will understand what Bhakti is. A young 21-year-old guy. What a famous guy he was. On his 21st birthday. You know how many letters he got? On his 21st birthday, he got seven truck loads of birthday wishes. Seven truck loads. You can imagine how famous he was. This is <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. Seven truck loads. And this guy, if you hear my sweet Lord, you will understand what level of devotion he had. So amazing. If he can experience bhakti, then you and me can definitely experience it. But provided we are sincerely chatting the name to the Lord. So these are the three things that happen when somebody takes up spiritual life seriously. Virakti, Parishana Bhava, and Bhakti. And Krishna, he tells Arjun. So he talks about the idea of Mityachara. And then he says, uh, 3.7 this is, he says, Yastuva Indriyani Manasa Niyam Niyam Ya Rabathe Rabathe Arjuna Karmendriya Karma Yogam Asakta Sa Vivasyate. He says, on the other hand, if a person sincere, if a sincere person tries to control the active senses by the mind, begins Karma Yoga in Krishna consciousness without attachment, he is by far superior. So Krishna is trying to tell you, don't just artificially renounce. Don't just artificially show that you are disconnected. Don't just artificially show that you, know, uh, you are in a high state of renunciation. But look at it from a consciousness point of view. Try to be in the right consciousness, which is far more important than externally renouncing. So Srila Prabhupada, 
he uh, you know brings this whole thing into a, such a powerful perspective um, with, with these uh, purports. So what is sannyas? So sannyasi is like a carrot. It's it's very interesting. You know, if you look at it. carrot, carrot is uh, saffron outside and saffron inside also, isn't it? You cut a carrot from all directions, it will be a same color only. Renounced the, the color of saffron, isn't it? And uh, so, unfortunately, many times what happens is externally someone seems to be in the renounced order, but that person is not really in the renounced order. But ideally, inner and outer alignment is very important uh, in the in, in the process of Krishna consciousness. And that's what uh, Krishna is, uh, Prabhupada is trying to uh, help us over here, help us understand uh, this concept. So, uh, we will take up one very interesting thing that uh, Krishna speaks about in this uh, particular chapter, when he speaks about what is the, uh, the purpose of work. So, uh, Krishna says that uh, perform your prescribed duty for doing so is better than not working. One cannot even maintain one's physical body without work. So the nature of the soul is to be very active. Niyatam pur karmatvam. He says, your body, Arjun, he's talking to Arjun, right? What is Arjun's body meant for? Arjun is a Kshatriya, he's a warrior. His body is meant to fight. Sharira yatrapi chate. He says, you cannot even maintain your body without work. So even to maintain a body, you have to work. He's saying you are a Kshatriya, you are not a Brahman. You are not, you are not a Brahman to say I'll go to the forest and meditate. Do what your nature is. Do what your nature is. And whatever your nature is, do it for the pleasure of Krishna. So those who have uh, you know, technically renounced, but uh, they are also doing work. But their work is of a different nature. It's not that somebody in the renounced order of their lives can say, I don't, I will not work at all. Even that person has to work. But that work is different. And the person who is grasta also has to work. So the nature of that work is different. But nonetheless, both have no choice but to work. So Arjuna is trying to tell Krishna, I'll work. But when I work, which is what is what is the Kshatriya's work? The Kshatriya's work is to kill. So Arjun is saying, if I work, I'll get so many reactions. I'll, I'll suffer so much sin because karma means reactions. And with that reaction, how will I survive? I don't want to do such work. So Arjun is telling Krishna that. Now Krishna brings him a very interesting concept. He talks about work for a higher purpose. And this is the essence of this entire discussion. And this is the conclusion of this discussion that Krishna is trying to share with Arjuna. This verse 3.9 is a very important verse for Gita. And it's a, it's actually a foundational work, a foundational verse uh, of Bhagavad Gita. And I want all of you to, if possible, buy at this verse. 3.9. This verse is Yakyarto Karmano Nyetra Lokoyam Karma Bandhanat. Tadartam karma kaunteya mukta sangha samachara. He says, work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise, work causes bondage in the material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction. And in that way, you always remain free from bondage. Look at this advice of Krishna. This is the most amazing advice you can get in your life. What is Krishna trying to tell Arjun? He's telling Yagyartha Karmano Nyetra. He's saying to Yagya as a sacrifice for the Lord. If you don't work for him, you will anyway have to, uh, you know, you will have to uh, go into what is known as Karma Bandhana. But if you work for Krishna, then you will be Mukta Sangha Samachara. All your reactions will be gone. Your work will become a karma. 
no reactions will accrue to you therefore you work for me this is work in progress what is work in progress work that will actually make one progress in our life our life is work in progress isn't it therefore you cannot remain without doing anything either you work for self purification and self realization for the sake of krishna so there are two people that are working a devotee and a non devotee a devotee of krishna also works and a non devotee also works but a non devotee when he works it is karma bandhanat every work that he does binds him more and more and more and more just like the example is given of a person who is walking in a on a road that has just been laid down and i don't know how many of you have ever stamped on tar with this sticky tar you know you get so one guy by mistake put his leg into a tar and he was so sticky that whole tar thing stuck on his leg so this guy to remove that tar from his leg he used the other leg you know he stamped the other leg and he tried to pull this leg then what happened the second leg also got stuck now and now this guy he was desperate he tried to use his hands to pull out that tar and what happened his hands also got stuck literally his entire body got stuck with tar now so when you are stuck in tar you can't use any other part of your body to remove that tar isn't it it just gets more and more and more messy this is what karma bandhanat means a, a non devotee is working the more he works the more he engages himself the more he gets stuck in the cycle of karma the complicated mesh of karma but for a person who is a not who is a devotee who is working it is mukta sanga samachara what does it mean uh, let's take example of the cassette player you know i'm i'm sure all of you all who are on this call at least most of you all would have seen cassettes in your life hope so and those who have not seen you can google it probably you will find some cassette player or the past so these cassettes have uh, work, worked in a very interesting way you know so one side used to become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and the other side will go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller right that's how the reel works basically a devotee's life is exactly like this cassette player what happens is as a person works more and more and more a devotee his karma bandhana is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing and decreasing by the end of his life he has no karma left to deal with he is free completely free mukta sanga samachara that means he is working in this world but he is not a part of this world he is not bound by the complication and the mesh of this world he is completely freed from all the mess that uh, that uh, you know um, a non devotee would end up in so two people may work in the same office do the exact same jobs have the exact same profile have the exact same speed of working but one person every work he does is becoming freer mukta sanga samachara and one person his karma is increasing and increasing and increasing he is getting into the cycle of karma bandhana what is the difference the only difference is yagyarto karma no niyatra the only difference is one is doing it for his own gratification his own pleasure the other is doing it for krishna's pleasure arjun is shooting arrows some other person also is shooting arrows but when arjun is shooting arrows he is shooting it for the pleasure of krishna another person is shooting arrows he is shooting for his own pleasure so that he becomes a king he becomes a ruler whatever so the moment you bring in krishna in between the entire consciousness changes that is called working for higher purpose you may be counting money as a cashier in a in a bank one person counting money hoping and aspiring that all this money one day comes into my pocket the aspiration is only for one's own gratification and that is known as karma bandhana 
But when a devotee is doing the same process of counting money, he's thinking, I wish I can do more and more service to Krishna. All the wealth in the world belongs to Krishna only. I want to serve him by using all the wealth of this world in his service. That person is actually getting liberated. Bhukta Sangha Samajar. And therefore, all of us, from this particular discussion of between Krishna and Arjun, we can understand this very simple concept of trying to work for a higher purpose. The soul is active. There is no way that you cannot be inactive. You can, you can be inactive. Even if you are inactive, your mind is active still. So you have to anyway be active. Be active for a higher cause. Work for a higher cause. Even if somebody is in a renounced order of life, even that person has to work. And therefore, a person in the renounced order of life or a person who is a grahastha within the family life, both of them have to work. But the, the uniting factor is when they work for a higher purpose. That is technically no work only because it doesn't bind you. And that's what the idea of renunciation is. And that's what the idea of Tyaga that Krishna is trying to introduce us to in this particular section of the Gita. Hare Krishna. Stop here. Any quick questions, comments, discussions, please? Anybody has any questions? Please feel free to ask. I hope uh, this kind of discussion was not too heavy and too over the top for you all. <laughs> wow, no questions today. That's very interesting. <laughs> I, I think we not... all are digesting what you said. <laughs> Great. So, uh, we'll uh, catch up next uh, Tuesday. We'll discuss uh, next Tuesday, just to give you all a, uh, a heads up. Uh, we, go, we are going to get into the next two Tuesdays are going to be phenomenal. Because we're going to get into a concept known as a yoga ladder. This is a concept every one of you must learn, must understand. It's a very, very transformative and life-changing concept that I'm going to be sharing for the next two sessions. It is known as a yoga ladder. It, talk, it gives you a full, full in-depth uh, progression for, uh, of, of your spiritual lives. You know, and you will actually begin to understand what Prabhupada is doing for us, when you understand the yoga leader very well. And uh, you look to appreciate what you're getting in these classes when you understand the yoga leader very well. So please try your best to attend uh, the next two sessions live as much as possible. Uh, and uh, even if you can't attend live, but at least catch up on the recordings, but don't miss the next two sessions. They are really going to be very, very powerful and uh, great value adds in your understanding and appreciation of spirituality. Okay? So we'll catch you all next Tuesday. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.